Right. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> We will look forward to his arrival. <laughs> All right, good evening. Currently, I'd like to confirm that scrutiny board meetings continue to take place using hybrid equipment, with some participants being in the council chamber and some joining via the video conferencing system. May I remind everyone present this meeting will be broadcast live via the internet and record, a record will be archived for future viewing. As usual, any member of the press and public may listen to proceedings via a web link, which has been publicised on the Council website. The participants in this meeting will be members of the Security Board officers presenting reports and invited guests. May I remind officers and members participating in during this meeting, all participants control their own microphones. There will now be a roll call to confirm members that are present at the meeting. Members to be present, uh, Councillor Diane Howe, I see. Councillor Dave Finwell, I see. Councillor Annette McKenzie, I see. Councillor Katie Blunt, I see. And Councillor Marcus Brain. Councillor Rosa Sexton. And as I've said earlier, we look forward to seeing Steve Cordwell as soon as is possible. Also attending virtually, I, I, I see uh, the Cabinet Member for Adults, Social Care and Health, Councillor Tony DeSico. Welcome, Tony. So, item one, are there any apologies? There's been one apology, which is from Councillor Richard Long. So. Thank you. Declaration of interests. Are there any declarations of interest? No, I see none. Uh, item three, questions and deputations. We haven't received any to that effect. Item four, minutes. We now consider the minutes of the meeting held on the 18th of January, 2022. Are there any questions or matters arising from these? Page five, six, seven, eight, Nine. I see. Can I take those members that those are accepted? Thank you. So it comes to item five, our first substantive item of work, digital technology and healthcare. Let's go to that bit. Take it. Uh, we, we have a presentation. I don't know if members have a, a copy of that to hand. Uh, and I'll now hand over to uh, our officers to, to present. Uh, Tim, would you like to uh, kick off with this one, please? Um, okay, is the uh, the slides up on the screen? Joe was going to share the slides. Okay, um, thank you. Um, my name's uh, Tim Atak. I'm the uh, NHS Birmingham and Solihull Digital Lead, uh, and I'm also the, the primary care CIO and joined by my colleague, uh, Clara, if you want to introduce yourself. Uh, yes, thank you very much for inviting us here this evening. Um, my name's Clara Day. I'm a kidney doctor at uh, University's Hospital Birmingham, but I'm also the interim clinical lead for Birmingham and Solihull Integrated Care System. So we've got um, a few slides here that Tim will lead off on in a minute. Um, and um, hopefully uh, that will provide you an overview and then we can answer some questions in a little while for you. So hand over to you, Tim. Okay, thank you. And as you said, we, we want to run through a number of examples of how digital technology is helping us improve care. Um, I suggest we run through the, the short presentation. It shouldn't take more than five, 10 minutes. 
and then we open up at the end for questions, if that's OK. Um, next slide, please, Joe. Um, we're seeing a wide range of benefits through better use of technology. Um, these include supporting more informed care, um, supporting joined up care across care professionals and organisations. Uh, it allows us to provide care closer to home, including at your own home. Um, it supports us managing, supports patients managing their own care. Um, it makes us more productive. And increasingly, we're seeing through uh, examples of artificial intelligence based technology, um, it's actually replacing clinical roles, which helps us grow our care capacity. Um, as this slide demonstrates, we're working with a whole family of organisations involved in your care. And, and not just across Birmingham Solihull, but across the Midlands as well. And, and crucial to this, and we keep reminding ourselves, is keeping the patient at the centre of what we do. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we've got many, many projects in place, and we could spend all evening talking through those. Um, what I will say is that we've got governance in place to ensure that we're able to manage the projects. Um, we're using systems that are uh, evidence to safe to use. We've got the appropriate data sharing agreements in place. Um, we measure the impacts and benefits, uh, but also we, we measure the unintended, con unintended consequences and we learn from that. Um, we're very conscious of the need to support digital inclusivity uh, and we're working with partners to ensure one, that digital solutions are accessible to all. Uh, working with partners on how we're able to increase digital access to our population. Um, but I think crucially from our learning that um, some of our populations, some of our services are not best served through digital and we need to keep those traditional face to face uh, approaches in place. And I think that's a lot of learning that we're getting coming out of COVID. Um, it's worth noting that the government is investing in digital and there are some 2.1 billion available to health and social care over the next three years. Uh, and what we want to talk through the next four slides is some examples of how we're using uh, technology in healthcare. Next slide, please. Clara. So thank you, Tim. So one of the first uh, projects that we'll just talk about is something that was accelerated by COVID. We were planning to do this anyway, but uh, at the point where we uh, had in the first wave in uh, March 2020, and we wanted to reduce as much footfall onto the hospital sites as possible. We rolled this out very rapidly. And this was what we call the teledermatology service. And we rolled this out in April 2020 into four hubs across our um, Birmingham Sully Hall, and there's one in um, Grove Road. And this was a system where all patients referred in for a possible skin cancer on what we call our two-week wait pathway, go to one of these centres and have a photograph taken of uh, the suspicious lesion using a uh, digital camera. And then that is, along with some basic history uh, uh, taking by the staff there, is then relayed back to the hospital for them to uh, review and to prioritise what is then needed to happen. And by doing this, we can prioritise those who need to be seen very rapidly versus those who can be seen quickly but not uh, as a, such a high priority. And in, and in some cases, in around 25% of cases, we're able to reassure from that photograph alone and say that actually that doesn't need investigation as a skin cancer uh, in that way. And we're, at the moment, we're getting about 85 patients a week through Grove Road uh, in this service. And it's really helped also the two week wait pathway for skin cancer in massively reduce the waits for that first assessment. So at the moment, this works in two ways in that the photos are taken and then relayed into the uh, hospital consultants and they assess them. But alongside that, we're working with skin analytics on this artificial intelligence element of uh, analysis as well. And one of the key things with artificial intelligence is that as clinicians and, of course, as members of the public, there needs to be faith that it works and that it works as well as a clinician reviewing the, um, the patient. And so this is a, an extended piece of work where we're running the two uh, elements together. So being reviewed by the clinician and being reviewed by the artificial intelligence and learning together 
where the artificial intelligence works well and where it needs a bit of tweaking to enable it to work as well as the clinicians. So that element of a diagnostic in the community and then being relayed into the clinicians is also about is also working in ophthalmology. Um, we're being rolled out across the Birmingham and Solihull patch and is likely to work start working in ENT shortly as well. And we're also working with partners with artificial intelligence around breast screening as well. And again, this kind of very rigorous assessment of the technology along with clinical assessments so that all of us are happy that it works as well as we would like it to. So that's the uh, first example I'd like to give. Can we have the next slide, please? This is another one. So this is um, a technique working with uh, our older persons uh, assessment and liaison team, which is called the OPAL team, which is works across um, the whole of the health and social care system to try and keep patients at home and to uh, prevent uh, hospital admissions where at all possible. And what this piece of work has done is twinned the OPAL team at the hospital with West Midlands Ambulance Service. So when they're called out to see a patient at home, that there is a video technology link between the ambulance and the team so that discussion can occur as to what treatment needs to be given immediately and whether actually a patient could be enabled to stay at home with some community support either from the OPAL team or the wider um, community services team. Um, and this has reduced conveyancing of uh, patients into hospital. And we're also now putting this technology into care homes so that again, the staff are able to communicate directly with the OPAL team. And to begin with, we've just been using video technology, but we're now beginning to expand that to use some uh, digital uh, diagnostic tools, such as um, a simple ultrasound machine. So this, again, is just helping us to connect experts across the system to make sure that the patient is put at the centre of this and only brought to hospital if needed. Next slide, please. So Tim will talk you through this one. So I'll pick this up. Um, so you know, care is often provided across a range of uh, organisations and care uh, professionals. Um, the public often thinks that you know your GP or your hospital consultant has access to the full uh, medical history, uh, but sadly that's not the case. And we, and we have consistently have issues with a lack of, of, of a no single common record. Now, we do have some small examples in place, um, but for the first time, we're developing a, a local shared care record across the whole of Birmingham and Solihull. Um, the first organisations went live uh, towards the end of last year, and, and more organisations are going live this year. We're currently rolling access to all of the Solihull and Birmingham GPs. Um, majority of organizations are providing access to their patient record as well as being able to view the shared record there are some such as hospices uh, that are at, at this stage simply viewing the record um, it's not just a birmingham solihull record though um, we're actually joining up these services across the whole of the midlands uh, and we've already joined up with coventry and warwickshire so um, your local GP will be able to see that if you've been, for example, to, to Warwick Hospital to see that part of the care record. Uh, similarly, you may actually have a Warwickshire GP and they'll be able to see the Birmingham Solihull record. Um, now, we're rolling this out across a, a range of care professionals and we're starting to monitor the benefits that, that teams are saying. Um, just some small examples. I was speaking to a GP who's just starting using this. Um, so in one of his clinics, um, he saw a patient and they needed some uh, hospital tests. However, he could see the patient had recently had these tests as part of a hospital visit and could see the results. Uh, that meant that the uh, GP was able to start the treatment for that patient immediately. Um, so that's a benefit for the patient's care. It meant the patient didn't need to go for a needless visit to hospital for those tests. And crucially, those tests were available for somebody else's care. Um, he also saw a, a, a pregnant mother through that session. Um, he had access to the maternity record and that actually gave a more accurate expected birth date and that changed the treatment he was going to give for that mom, providing better care for her and her unborn child. Um, 
We believe that the shared care record will provide significant improvement to how we provide care today, but it also, by having up a joined up care record, it actually allows us to fundamentally change how we deliver some of our services. We think this will be a real game changer in delivering healthcare across our system. Um, next screen, please. Thanks, Tim. So, so far, the examples that we've given, the uh, digital technology is kind of running in the background and may change the way that uh, patients, uh, where, the, where the patients go to access care, but hasn't really needed interaction um, with technology by uh, patients and citizens. And this uh, last one is looking at that in um, more detail. And this is uh, UHB, again, has started to work with a company called Doctor Doctor. And this allows UHB to communicate directly with patients who have access either to a smartphone or an email to send out details of appointments and the appointment letter uh, by this methodology rather than as a letter. And it also then enables the patient to interact with the app and if the appointment isn't convenient to uh, cancel that or delay the appointment so that that can be appointment can be used again and, uh, and a new one issued. Now, at this stage, we started to uh, use the app for that way about this time last year and have sent out around 600,000 um, notifications for outpatients. We are also beginning to use it in other ways to assess people who are on the waiting list for uh, uh, procedures and to whether they still need that procedure or not, and also whether they need um, interaction around that procedure um, whilst they're on the waiting list. And we're using it as well, beginning to use it over the next few months for something called patient initiated follow up. So for patients who might have a long term condition and instead of just giving an appointment every three months, for instance, we would uh, allow them a, an open opportunity to have an appointment and they would contact us back through this technology. Um, and some, sometimes that would be paired with some questions to help the clinical staff guide um, the urgency associated with that appointment. And a lot of that at the moment is done by phoning specialised nurses who, of course, will still be there. But this just um, makes it a little bit uh, tidier from that respect for those who are able to use this technology. Now, what we're extremely aware of, and as a clinician, I challenge all the time when working with my digital colleagues is that for some people, use of technology is easier than for others. So whenever we're introducing technology such as this, there is patient user testing to make sure it's as convenient as possible, but we will continue to always run a mirror non-digital option so that for patients who are find it more difficult to access this technology that they still have the ability to be able to do this. So for instance, in the doctor doctor application, if a patient hasn't opened their uh, text within seven days, we just send out the letter anyway, so that, that we're making sure that people um, are not in, inconvenienced by not being able to access this. The other thing that the, this uh, technology allows us to do at UHB is to use our video consultation software, which again was rolled out very rapidly with uh, other providers at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. But this, um, we've tried various uh, suppliers and we've settled with this one now, which allows text links directly into the video rather than having to download separate applications to access. And we're very aware that video technology uh, was introduced rapidly and I use video quite a bit actually. I look after patients with kidney disease who, who I've looked after for quite a long time and because I, uh, they're, they're home-based treatments throughout the pandemic when we've tried to keep them safe at home, we've uh, trialled using video technology and phone. And I think what's clear is as we move forward, we all need to have uh, you know, systems in place which we're working very hard at to understand when, from a clinical perspective, we can use video technology or, or phone for an appointment and combine that with patient choice. So that, because I understand when I'm using, with my, some of my patients, particularly the younger ones, are absolutely delighted to be using video technology, where some patients, particularly if they're hard of hearing or they struggle with the setting up the software, um, would much rather come in and see me face to face. And so it's that combination of where is it clinically appropriate and when is it appropriate for the patient that we're working towards as a clinical community as a whole to make this uh, the use of it as good as possible. 
And the other thing that we're trying to do is, I'm sure you're aware of the NHS app now, and that's one of the ways that we've been booking vaccines, for instance, and we're able to interact and order prescriptions. And at the moment, what we're ending up with is a lot of different healthcare applications where you have to download separate apps. But one of the reasons we're working with Doctor Doctor is that very soon we'll hopefully be able to integrate that into the NHS app so that as a patient, you only have one healthcare app that you go into and there's, um, that will then direct you into the right uh, area. But that's something that all of us are working on over the next few months to make it more convenient for people. So that's where I'm going to stop at the moment, um, but we're both very happy to answer questions. So I wonder if we could take the slides down, Joe, if possible. Just before I open this up to members, I noticed in the A, the sheet, Beasle shared care record status. You mentioned, I've heard a, a fair bit said about how useful this is for GP practices, but this is shown as still being under development. Yes. How far have you got with that exactly? So we've got five GPs that are now live with the service. And so they've been our test group. There's a further 50 GP practices going live over the next four weeks. Um, and then we expect the remaining practices to go live, um, you know, over, over the spring, really. <laughs> with that, I open the floor to questions. Councillor Blunt. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's great that we're rolling out um, the integrated digital technology, I think it's about time. Um, I, I think this is something that should probably have really been kicked off years ago, um, but it is great to see that it's finally happening. Um, question about um, some of the, as you say, actually getting um, access to your GP records and things. Uh, so there's a wide disparity. Some GP practices simply will not let you um, register for digital access unless you basically take in your entire life story, passport, driver's license and everything. Um, and they stopped registering pa patients for digital access during COVID. I mean, I haven't been able to register at my GP and, you know, I'm one of the age group where everything is is very easy for me with technology. Um, so question about um, actually getting people online and um, through their GP when some GP practices actually aren't uh, massively keen on this and how we make this a smooth process, um, you know, because a lot of people um, don't actually, like the vast majority of the population, don't actually go to their GP that often. They register and then, you know, might go once a blue moon. Um, so, so actually, how do we how do we get that process right? Thank you. So, if I pick that up in a number of ways, um, one, we are actually as CCG working with all of the the GP practices um, and PCNs on on how they're using their digital technology. Um, we're just doing a review of of all of their websites. We've agreed set of standards, so we're going to supporting them to make sure that they consistently meet those set of standards and similarly how they're using and taking advantage of technology. Um, as you say, some are, um, are very enthusiastic, some are a little reluctant, um, but the NHS is turning on the NHS app for all um, in April. I think just over um, half our population have actually downloaded the app. Um, at present, you have to get um, the GP practice to then approve you to access your GP records, um, whereas I the plan is that from April that will be April that will be automatically turned on. So if you want access to your GP record, you will be able to see that through the NHS app. Uh, thank you, um, much appreciated. I look forward to finally seeing my my records. Um, second question: There are some people out there who quite rightly are sceptical of all of their records being online and you know like their privacy what do we do with the people who opt out full stop of sharing their records i appreciate it's a fairly small number but i do recall when we first um introduced a lot of the online record keeping quite a lot of people did write to their gp specifically opting out so what are we doing with that a fairly small cohort of people uh, and, and that's still in place through the shared care record that um, if a member of the public um, wishes to opt out, 
um, their records will be excluded. Um, there's an interesting moot point about, um, which I know there's a, there's a conversation going on, that if you're providing emergency care to a patient, um, should that override that? Um, but what's being built into the, the shared care record is that option for, for the public to opt out. And I'm presuming as well, if you're the victim of domestic violence, for example, um, there will be similar safeguards because one thing, um, you know, all backgrounds of people can be a perpetrator of domestic violence. Doctors, nurses, etc., are not excluded from that category. Um, what would we be doing to protect the interests of, again, a very small but very important cohort of people? So yes, my understanding those controls are in place. Um, but again, I will make sure you know I follow that specific question with our shared care record team. Thank you ever so much. Councillor Sexton. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yes, I've got I've got a few questions. Um, some really interesting presentation there, and um, clearly there are a lot of good things happening in terms of uh, the uh, the digital transformation. Um, can I ask, with the AI systems that are being developed? What standards of testing are in place and that th those systems are subject to before they're, um, they're relied upon? Um, I mean, it's good to hear that trials are being conducted at the moment, comparing that um, the, the AI um, verdict with that of a clinician. Um, but do we have a system in place? Because, I mean, for example, with, with drugs, we know that there are certain um, hoops that drug companies have to jump through and, you know, certain standards they have to meet in terms of the, the testing of drugs before that they are, they're um, brought onto the market to make sure that they're both safe and effective. Is there a comparable system for AI systems? Shall I answer that, Clara, or do you want yes, to? Yes, could you? Yeah, no, you can answer okay. it from a regulation perspective. And, I'll okay. pick up the um, and, and the answer is yes. So what, what you referred to there was the what's known as the MRHA. So any drug or um, medical device um, has to go through a, an approval process. And, and, and artificial intelligence software is viewed as a medical device. Um, so it, it is going through that. And I think it's fair to say that's one of the challenges we've got now that um, UHB and other organizations are involved in developing AI. Um, they're now getting to the point where they can evidence that they are consistently that more accurate than human beings. And, and they are now working with the MRHA to take those uh, systems through that process. So they are actually accredited to replace a human being. And, and that's why I believe that generally they're being used um, in parallel rather than as replacement at the moment. Yeah, and I think also the, the there's the regulatory elements, but as a clinician, you know, when we're we're used to seeing people face to face, and we're used to relying on our own judgment and experience around conditions, and when you're uh, in charge of a pathway and you are introducing AI as a clinician, you have to be very sure also that that technology is working so that's why when we're in the in the systems that we're using at now that <clears throat> we're trialing it whilst running the pathways at the same time so that the clinicians have a feel for it and then can say whether or not they're confident of it even if it is mhra signed off so that you know you would never implement a pathway if the clinicians equally were not happy that it was appropriate thank you that's that's reassuring to hear um, looking at the the Opal, um, the the remote consultations um, are taking place. Um, you mentioned that some people now are less likely to have to go to hospital as a result of this system being in place. Are there outcome measures that um, you've recorded for um, the outcomes achieved um, using this system versus what might be achieved? had the system not been used and for example some of those people might have ended up going to hospital um, as a result of not having that system available um, I mean, have you compared uh, one with the other and uh, yes and yeah. so we haven't done we haven't done formal randomized controlled trials i'd have to say in this context which of course would be the the nicest way to be able to do it but again in the context of 
these kind of burning platforms of COVID and and we've the I haven't presented the data to you there, but the conveyances, uh, you know, which is how we measure transfer into hospitals, were down significantly where this was being used. It's you know, but what we don't want to do is stop bringing people into hospital and then not provide them with extra support at home if they still need it. So so it, it isn't a kind of either or. It isn't either, you know, you come into hospital or you just stay at home by yourself. It might be directing to a more appropriate form of care for a period of time for that individual. Um, so it, it, it's sometimes an access into different aspects of service that health and social care provide rather than uh, an A&E attendance. So certainly at the moment it is reducing it down, but you know it, it is being done in a way that is, you know, not as rigorous as a randomised control trial because we have felt that it is that it's effective and and therefore we want to introduce. So you mentioned that you've shown that the the conveyances to hospital are down, but are you then following the patients up? So the ones who did go to hospital versus the ones who didn't go to hospital and the ones who where, where the system was used and versus where, where it wasn't used um, and seeing what outcome that patient achieves. So, I mean, for example, in the in the event that, um, you know, how many serious um, incidents might there be at the end of that or, you know, um, like I say, potentially, I mean, potentially patient deaths or some some something like that. Um, so I'm not close enough to the detail to be absolutely sure around this, but I also know that we're it's linked now to a virtual ward program that is being set up by a, you know, a combination between community services and the OPAL team, which will be following all these kind of uh, outcomes as well. And, and obviously the governance around safety at a system level is strict so that if serious incidents start popping up anywhere, we will be aware of them. But if you want more information from that team, I'm sure we can find it for mm -hmm. you. Tim, did you have more information? No, as you said there that, you know, we understand that they are, you know, measuring the benefits, the impact, and we can go back to that team just to, to, to be very clear on that. You know, Clara and I have actually seen the data on the conveyancing rates, but um, at the moment they don't want us to, to start quoting the figures before that. Um, they've tested that data, but, you know, we have seen a big drop in conveyancing rate because you know, the patient doesn't need to come to an A&E. Um, what we can do is essentially take the, prof the professionals to the patient. That would be very helpful. I would love to see some more data on that. And I mean, obviously it's great that fewer people are needing to go into hospital, but I mean, I'm sure you would agree that what we want to be very sure of is that they are not being harmed as a result of not going to hospital. Yeah. Um, and until we see the data on outcomes, it's very hard to say that for certain. Um, so it would be good to have that. Um, so if you could follow up, that'd be great. Um, can I, can just... I just come back with that Sorry. a little bit as well, is that what we do know is that often A&E is not a nice place for a patient equally. So that it's not what we're saying, that actually we're trying to provide care that is best in that circumstance. And the A&E is always the kind of lowest risk for a professional point of view as to where to go, but equally is not... Um, the nicest place when you're having to wait periods of time or be away from carers, particularly at the moment. So it's it's a kind of balancing, you know, what's best overall. But certainly, we're very happy to link you up with the team. Absolutely, and I completely understand that hospital is not the best place for everyone. So, and uh, that it would be great to get that, just get that confirmed. Thank you. Um, talking about the shared care records, Councillor Blunt um, mentioned people who may opt out from um, their, their data being shared. What I'm wondering is what steps are being taken to enable patients to understand what's happening the, and the implications of these shared care records and to control how and with whom the, that data is shared. For example, somebody might be very happy and actually quite keen to have that data shared with an emergency healthcare professional, but not necessarily to have it shared with, for example, a commercial organisation. So it seems important that people are able to um, have fine control over how that data is shared rather than just an all or nothing switch. Okay, so first to be very clear, this, this is a, a shared care record. It is for health and social care professionals only. Um, it is not something that we're providing um, outside of the, the health and care family. 
Um, it's very much about supporting the treatment of, of patients and the public. So there are no commercial organisations involved as such. It's those that, that are involved in, in, in the care of our, of our citizens. Um, as part of the, of the rollout of the service, particularly through um, GPs, we are providing leaflets and information uh, about the shared care record, what it's being used for, uh, and if they want to opt out. Um, so that's part of the, of the rollout program. Um, I think it's fair to say that you know the majority of the public contact the NHS through GPs, so that's where we are um, focusing on it. But all the organisations involved are, are using a common set of literature uh, to make the public aware of, of what the shared care record is for, uh, and if they want to discuss it or if they want to opt out, how they can do that. Thank you. Um, when you mentioned that it won't be shared with commercial organisations, I am aware that in some cases, um, UHB Trust has shared, I believe, pseudo anonymized patient data with commercial organisations without first seeking specific consent from those patients. Um, I believe that I'm right in saying that. Um, can you confirm that no data, anonymised or otherwise, will be shared from these shared care records? The, the shared care record has been designed to support patient care, so there is no intention to share that you know, information outside the, the local care family. That's not what it's been designed to do. I hear that it's not been designed to do that and yeah, there's so, no intention yeah, so, to share that. Can no, so, you confirm I, that it will not be? Well, you know, there, as I said, at the moment, yes, there is no plans at all to share that data and, and that's not what it's been built. It's been very much designed around the care of the individual. Okay, the omission there is noted. Thank you. Um, so, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm trying to give that, that assurance I can, you know, as of today. Sure, no, I, there I, I are appreciate no plans. you may not be able to give me that assurance and, and I appreciate your uh, candidness with that. Thank you. Um, in terms of um, digital communication, so particularly when working with um, primary care, for example, um, and also when we were talking about the OPAL system earlier, and sometimes you know, when, when patients are sent questions that they can answer in order to determine how urgent something is, um, how do we ensure that patients have adequately understood the question, particularly if they're responding in text form? So I think if we have any concerns, this, well, these, these questions at the moment through Dr. Doctor will be reviewed by a clinician. They are not being reviewed through any form of algorithm. So if there is any concerns associated with the questions, we will just contact the patient. And, and actually what is likely to happen in these circumstances is that the patient will then be contacted anyway. So if, you, if at the moment we've got um, call lines, it's also say for, uh, for I work in renal, um, we have systems in place where there's specialist nurses who, particularly for some of our transplant patients, who might just be called around certain aspects. Um, and what we might do is use this in areas to kind of formalise that a little bit. But in order to assess the patient's need associated with that, if there is any ambiguity, then we would call the patient and, and ensure that would be the case. You would also make sure that when we sign patients onto these pathways, it's not everybody going on to them we would make sure that people were able to use the technology and were happy to use the technology and happy to understand safety netting associated with it they're always being a phone call alternative because we need to maintain that anyway when we're introducing any of these digital pathways such that they were able to contact if they needed to thank you um i suppose my concern is when patients may not they may not realise that they haven't understood the question and if the clinician doesn't realise that the patient hasn't understood the question then there may not be anything to flag a concern um, so it's good to hear that there are alternatives available are patients able to request a face-to-face -face as an alternative if they feel more comfortable with it or is that a decision that would only be available if the clinician decided that that was appropriate so if we're talking about video technology, um, then yes, I mean, we, we obviously we went through a phase during the first wave um, when we were all, you know, unaware exactly what was going to be happening, where uh, outpatient appointments were very much reduced down from a face to face perspective. And as we've 
opened up and shut down over the last couple of years, there has been reduced availability of face-to-face -face space across the healthcare um, provision. But certainly within the hospital environment, if a patient is given a remote appointment and feels that it would be better off face-to-face, -face, then the team would be very sympathetic to that approach. And, and as I was saying, what, what emerged rapidly as kind of transformational change across outpatients in, at the point of necessity in the first wave of COVID is now being reassessed all the way through as to how best to continue to use this technology in a way that is clinically effective and safe so that the clinicians are happy with it and, uh, is, and also addresses patient choice. And where those kind of Venn diagrams overlap, then that's where we uh, use these technological approaches for uh, you know, outpatient review. If there's, what we don't want to be doing particularly is um, uh, using technology which doesn't allow the full clinical assessment to have taken place in an effective way in the first place um, and then provoking uh, other appointments and of course that will always happen so if if someone is being reviewed remotely and the clinician feels that they need to come in then that would be enabled but what we want to try and do is get to the point where you're using the right approach the first time and as I've said for a patient, if a patient feels that using something remotely is not for them and they find it very difficult, then we would offer them the face-to-face. Uh, -face. But a lot of patients equally, particularly younger ones who are, you know, are very keen to interact in this way. So it's managing, it's, it's just us getting to the point where we're happy about using this technology as the best for all. That's great, thank you. And it's really good to hear that that um, idea of finding the right approach for each patient is uh, is continuing to be um, to be thought about. So I'm, I'm aware that there are some patients who, particularly during the first wave of COVID, were very uncomfortable with um, the mean having to use remote means to to talk to healthcare pr practitioners. Um, so it's it's good to hear that there's going to be some flexibility there. And I completely agree that for some people it worked really well. Um, Thank you, Dr. Sexton. For the moment. Before we, we move on, there are a couple of key points that I'd like to pick up out of, out of that. First, these are short questions. Uh, does the AI system require nice approval before it can be implemented? The diagnost AI diagnostics. So I think it will go through, you know, a, a national regulatory body before it can be used solely as AI. And I think that's why everybody runs in parallel. I, I, I thought it was MRHA, but um, we can clarify that. Yeah, if you can clarify that for us, that's, yeah. that's most important. Thank you. Next item is, is the formal training a certification of clinicians using this system to ensure they're happy with AI and all the rest of it? And there's a formal training system for it. So it's as a sign off. You have heard a sign off mentioned. I just wanted to know whether the training certification was formalised. So to some extent, the AI, of course, is used instead of a clinician, um, um, rather than the clinician signed off to use it. And then, as I say, it, it becomes a regulatory issue. Um, no clinician would ever use any form of technology from a you know just from a probity perspective, if unless they felt happy that they were able to use it so all forms of things that are introduced training will be offered so sometimes people feel that they need a formal training program uh, sometimes people will do it through you know, toolkits etc um, so whenever we introduce new technology clinicians will need to be happy with it but there won't necessarily be kind of formal sign off in that way that you describe uh, I think many of us would view that the NHS and most of our healthcare provision operates in a challenging legal environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, for one, would be concerned that your response to that would not play well in that challenging environment if it was put to the test. Do you agree? Um, well, I'm I mean, what I'm saying is that the AI is used instead of a doctor. So the doctor is not using the AI, the healthcare professional is not using that. They're working alongside it. And as we've just talked about, the regulatory process is to ensure that those are working as well as they need to from a sign-off perspective. I would contend that 
perhaps there's an, a further discussion you need to have with your teams just to be sure of those points. What do you think? I mean, I'm happy to take it away and discuss it with the teams, but I mean, I know as a clinician that we are thoroughly trained in all the technology that we use and, uh, you know, happy to use it in, in the way that it is supposed to be used. I'll probably ask that you come back to us on that. The other thing is, have you done a back-to-back -back comparison exercise between a, a controlled batch of patients who've been through both systems? So the AI will be used in randomised AI and face-to-face. -face. So, sorry, with the... Which systems? A back-to-back -back between the current method that we use for diagnosis and yes. uh, the AI-assisted method. So the AI-assisted method is part of their um, sign-off which is not done by ourselves, which is done by the regulatory bodies, will require comparison with, uh, with current care. Uh, my question is, has it occurred? Is, so, are there uh, reports that say, yes, this has been done, that you've seen? Yes. I mean, I don't use this technology, but yes, they will be, they will be, that will be part of regulatory sign-off for, for the use of those technologies. And I think the key point you said, Clara, is that at the moment they, they're used in parallel. So what typically is for a, um, a diagnostic of, of an image, they'll run it through AI and they'll run it through the human. So actually in every single case, they're comparing the outcome. That's, a, yeah, okay, yeah. I accept that. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that, uh, also records. Do you, are you following data protection law, law for those healthcare records? Can you confirm that? Yes, that you've done some kind of an assessment to ensure that those laws you're operating safely in that respect. It's, it's the heart of what we do on a day to day basis. Sorry, could you have that again, please? Well, it's the heart of what we do um, through through care that, you know, individuals and organisations are following the, the, the laws around, you know, data protection, confidentiality, etc. You know, it's a requirement on, on every profession. For their per, per professional regulation, it, it's a requirement on, on any, any, every individual who works in the NHS, uh, but also our, you know on legal requirements as an individual. So we all undergo regular training um, that's measured uh, to make sure that we're aware of the laws and, and following those processes. Can I take that as a yes for the yes. presidency? Thank you. Right, let's move on to it. Was Councillor McKenzie was next? I think. Thank you. Thank you for all that information. <clears throat> I can imagine after the pandemic and people going to hospital that they wouldn't want to particularly go back into hospital now, not being able to have visitors, um, being away from all their family, their support. So I can imagine that they would prefer to stay at home if possible, which is a good thing, I think, uh, as a lot did contract COVID whilst in hospital. So um, my, my worry is that we have a lot of residents who will perhaps be left behind because they haven't got the technology, the smartphones, the internet. And I did look on a site today and it actually said that you couldn't access it unless you did have a mobile phone, which isn't good. And I tried to get onto the appointments and it said that page wasn't available. So there's a worry there that when people are trying to access these um, sites, that they're not easily accessible. Um, and also, and I'm not au okay fait that much with technology, like Councillor Blunt is like my children's age, and they are a whiz on it, which would suit them much much better than my age i think but is is there a backup system in place in case it crashed or i don't understand it but if it did so as i you know outlined a little bit during the presentation we are extremely aware of the need to run parallel systems anything that we introduce that involves 
interaction of citizens with technology. We are also, we monitor the, um, the uptake, for instance, of Dr. Doctor who is using it and who isn't, which helps us to um, assess areas where we need to be very mindful of ensuring that there's uh, backup systems, as you say. So whenever we introduce something, there is always the original system or a, a non-technology system in place. So for instance, I know that Dr. Doctor, which either requires a smartphone or um, an email, that there's re reduced uptake in as people get older, and there is some reduced uptake in the uh, more deprived areas of our city. Um, and so I can track where where that occurs. And and as healthcare providers, we have, and indeed as a you know as a as a public sector, we have various duties around this. One to make sure that people are never disadvantaged by that, and to deliberately think about that all the time, and also to work with our communities to see if there are any ways that we can help enable learning. And uh, local authority colleagues are much better than that at health, actually. And, and one of the things that we've set up at the moment is a uh, digital inclusivity project across the patch for us all to learn what we are trying out and then to work with communities to see if we can enable some access, for instance, through libraries or through patient worship so that people who would like to learn more about it are enabled to be able to do so. And anything that's introduced is also widely tested um, by the technology companies and indeed by us with our patients to make sure that it does feel accessible. So we're, you know, that is constantly on our mind and I wouldn't want you to think that that was not the case. Thank you. Is there somewhere to report if um, sites aren't accessible to everybody? So from a healthcare perspective, um, we there are uh, other systems in place. If you, the ones that the healthcare is using across the system now, the site itself may not be accessible, but you would hope that there would be a parallel, there would either be a phone number to call or something like that where people would be able to access that service if they weren't able to access through the internet options. So if you're not able to do that, and it's a service that we provide within Birmingham and Solihull, we would obviously want to know. Thank you. All right. Uh, Councillor Pinwell next. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you rightly pointed out, uh, video triage and video consultation has been available during the pandemic, but it's been a frustration to residents in my ward that its use has been very infrequent and very sporadic. Um, I think there's no question that a video consultation or triage is far greater in terms of patient experience than a telephone one. Um, and one would have thought the ability to see the patient at the far end of a video link must be beneficial to the doctor as well. So what have been the barriers to its use and how will they be overcome? So I can talk about that from a hospital perspective and Tim might be able to pick that up from a general practice perspective. So certainly within um, UHB, we've had video for a little while. It, we had to do some quite profound um, technological updates across the whole because associated with the merger with uh, of UHB to make sure that the hardware was available across everywhere and that the, the software, and that was just not really associated with the video technology, but just even the running systems behind that. But video technology is now available for every, you know, for everybody accessing UHB services. The take up um, has been a little bit variable, both from a clinician point of view and from a patient perspective. But what we're trying to do is, as we've discussed before, where the clinicians feel that it might be clinically appropriate to try and roll that out more and more to those who would want it going forwards and it is that that sweet spot of combining those two aspects in the kind of lesser COVID times that we just need to work to be able to provide. So that's from a from a hospital perspective um, the, the that I can update you on. I'll leave Tim with general practice. And I, and I think it's very similar that 
we've actually got some clinicians themselves have been reluctant to take on um, video. Um, I think pre-COVID, we were finding it very difficult to get a lot of clinicians to adopt that technology. And yet through COVID, they were forced, and in fact, um, very much embraced that. Um, so I think we have a re we've had a reset, both clinicians and the public in accepting the use of, of, of video to support um, uh, remote consultations. Um, there are, you know, continue to be instances where a, a GP would still want to see you in person. Um, there are sometimes they know they need to do tests, etc., and they'd rather do that part of that visit. Um, but you know what my my GP colleagues uh, report back is that they are trying to provide that mixed economy. So you know, particularly as we come out of COVID, it should be far more driven through patient choice. So they will offer the face to face. They will offer the the remote consult um, that's appropriate to that time, and but also to providing as much of the of services online. You know, we we taught example about you know, if you have got to have to do a diagnostic or you can provide some referral information beforehand that just makes the process um, more straightforward. So I think it's about providing choice. And I think that's that's where we're driving the way forward. Yeah, just, just for clarity, my comparison was not between face-to-face -face and video consultation. Um, I think the public has got the message that uh, remote consultation is here to come, but my observation was that telephone consultation has been the default. Um, and video consultation has not. So I'm hoping that what you're saying there is that that's going to change. If I could go on to a second question, then I think the use of video and telephone to connect um, paramedics at the ambulance back to more expertise um, in the center is, is a great thing. Um, but clearly, I would think the real game changer is when data can be real time transmitted from um, the ambulance or the patient home um, back to greater expertise in the center and that is where some real um, avoidance of long ambulance queues outside hospitals waiting to get into a and e can be achieved so how far away are we from actual data transmission back from remote to the center so i mean data comes in all sorts of different ways really i mean there is something qualitative around you know talking and getting as a doctor what a lot of what you do is history taking so you you're able to ask questions and and you can do that no, so, sorry can i clarify i'm talking about tele telemetry style data mm -hmm. collection so it's stuff which okay. is going into measurement equipment at the patient the remote patient is real time transmitted and visible to expert consultants at the center right okay sorry yes yeah. so i mean we are starting to use remote diagnostics in a lot of areas more than we have done before so cardiology again has expanded this hugely during the pandemic um so that uh, you know around uh, measurement of heart rates and that type of thing and this is obviously a key area that healthcare is keen to develop further oh, i don't tim did you want to come in no i i think there are actually a lot of examples of this now being um tested across the nhs in different care settings um so you we've got uh, she said that we talked about the remote stethoscope. We've got remote ECG, um, what, what's known as um, wearables. Um, so we've got examples of patients that are having wearables and monitoring a range of things, um, uh, both you know blood pressure, ECG, uh, glucose. Um, so there's a lot of this technology being tested at the moment. Um, I think what we're waiting for is what's the outcome of these. Um, but I know we've got colleagues. Just, I think I think what we we'll, we will typically see is that where a technology gets proven, um, you'll then see a very rapid rollout. You know, I mentioned the government's 2.1 billion, um, but this is something that they are very keen to support. Um, so as we start to I think, see converge on proven technology, um, I think you will see a rapid rollout uh, of this type of technology. Um, and we've got actually examples where they're using it in, in care homes. I, I think m my understanding at the moment, it's being increasingly used by, for example, ambulance crews or first at scene um, because it's where the technology is being regularly used so they know how to use it properly. 
but we've got examples of patients with long term conditions who do need to have um, regular monitoring. Um, so I'm aware of, of trials in that sector. So, yeah, I think you're right. I think we'll see a, a big explosion in the use of this technology once it becomes proven that it's safe to use and, and it will be, you know, um, it will continue to be used rather than as a, as a one off episode. That's really good news. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. I will move on to Council Howell, please. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you for a really interesting presentation. Um, I'm really excited about the use of digital in healthcare. I think it has the opportunity to transform how we deliver patient care and to really help to support clinicians with their decision making. And you've given some really good examples about how using digital appropriately with the right governance framework adhering to GDPR regulations can actually um, assist clinicians to um, signpost patients to the most appropriate clinical pathways. So Thank you for that. Um, I've just got a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned in earlier answers about how you are committed to maintaining equitable access to services, whether patients are able to access digital technology or not. But are you also committed to maintaining equitable patient satisfaction? So if someone is not able to access a digital service, are you able to track their satisfaction compared to a patient access in a digital service to check that the patients are equally satisfied whichever stream they're accessing? Um, I think that's a very fair uh, question. And again, you know, patient experience around all of this is key. I think that Again, as we come out of COVID and learn how to measure patient experience whilst we've while we've rolled out this, these digital aspects, that that is really important that we do so. Patients just need, I think, to feel that they've been enabled to access healthcare that provides their need in a way that is convenient and effective to them. So it will, as you say, it, it, it's it's that choice and that. Um, feeling that it's uh, appropriate that will be really important. There are standard ways of measuring patient satisfaction, but it may well be something that we as a system need to work more closely at going forwards over the next few years. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be really interesting to track just to see if there were, um, you know, if there are any, any differences at all. But thank you for answering that question. I've got one final question um, related to the shared care record slide. It's obviously quite a, a complex picture with an awful lot of different organisations working across different platforms. It's obviously a huge project to join everything up into one shared care record. I was just wondering if there is a target date when all those data streams are going to go live and how challenging is it trying to integrate all those different platforms that different organisations are using? So, so the hope that all of those organisations will be providing data this year. Um, so, so that that project is is progressing well. Um, I think the other thing then is, that, is then we start widening the access to it. So, you know, hospices is, is the first part. Um, I think we've started conversations with with care homes, uh, and the issue then is is really the the digital maturity of the care home rather than um, at the the shared care record side itself. Um, the, the the technology is becoming easier. Um, because most systems now have uh, adopt international standards t so they can talk to each other or what's known as interoperability um, and they also work differently so for example the, the, the GP record is actually a view um, it actually just views directly into the GP record um, whereas some of our other systems have to provide a copy of the data to then make it accessible so yeah that there are um, particular systems move towards open technology standards, it makes it simpler uh, for them to communicate with each other. And, and we see the same things when we talked about wearables, etc. The technologies are moving to more industry standards, which makes them easier to talk to each other. Uh, Thank you. I have to say with the shared care record that there, there's, there's the ambitions for it to do more um, because the clinicians are using it are saying, you know, this is great. This can improve care. You know, are having a conversation about providing um, a, a, a patient view of that shared care record um, linked to NHS app. So I think there's a lot of potential development around it. So I don't think it'll stand still. It will evolve 
um, as we see the benefits to it and benefits to that wider care sector. Can I, can I just come in as well? I mean, in order for a shared care record to work, it means that we've got very sophisticated and electronic patient records across all our care organisations as well. We're not using the same ones, which is why we need to join them up. But the GP records are very sophisticated uh, electronic records, which aid uh, clinician decision making as well. Um, and within UHB, we've long had a very sophisticated electronic patient record, which is now virtually rolled out across all of the sites with the combination of UHB, which you know allows prescribing, measured observations, noting, can be used for inpatients and outpatients. And that, those in itself, we haven't talked about particularly here, but those, the introduction of those records rather than paper notes across the system has transformed safety of care across our systems because it allows you know, decision support and, and prompting if things don't look right. And those have absolutely transformed the quality of care that we're able to provide. And and, and so the share, the, the joining up of those is kind of the end point of this uh, use of technology. And I don't want us to underestimate how important that digitization of the whole of healthcare has been in the background, which which we haven't really touched on today. No, no, thank you for that. I mean, it sounds like it's uh, the project's progressing very, very quickly, and I completely agree that, you know, sharing of information is between all these different agencies for the good of the patient is very, very important. So thank you for that. Just one extra quick question for me listening to all of that. Have you piloted a section of patients seeing their records? Because quite often when the patient sees a record, they'll in their own minds perform a validity check of some kind which could raise issues yeah we we've, we've got lots of examples where patients can view their record so i think as we touched on earlier that the ability to view your your gp record i know there are some organizations such as uhb provide a a, a patient portal um we we do think a key development of the shared record will be the ability for patients to view their record and then point out when and um, they believe it's incorrect. So, yeah. OK. Councillor Sexton. Thank you. If I could just have one final question. Um, I don't know if this is a current situation, um, but previously with the, some of the apps that people can use in order to access certain GP services, for example, repeat prescriptions. Um, there was one app that um, I was using for a while, which um, also advertised and sold private healthcare services on the same app. Now, I've since moved to the NHS app. Um, is there a move generally to persuade GPs to move more towards the NHS app and less towards some of these private apps that may also be selling and advertising private services to people who obviously by nature of having potentially having a medical condition may be quite vulnerable to being um, sold these uh, quite expensive services. So there's two parts to this. Um... One of which is the way the NHS has, has, has made services such as repeat prescriptions available. Um, the, the, the government have developed a, a standard interface that allows um, a, a broad range of companies once approved to use that. So you, you see all of the pharmacy vendors, um, such as Boots, et cetera, um, have an app that allows you to do, you know, order repeat prescriptions and to get that to the, uh, the pharmacy of your choice. Um, and that, and these are commercial companies. So we, you know, what we can't do um, is is then those commercial companies using those apps for for selling theirs and other services. Um, what I can say is that through the health sector, we are, um, I think, converging on the NHS app as as the app of choice, uh, and we are encouraging the public um, practices and, and other health providers to use the NHS app, um, which I hope will never have um, advertising on the front of it. So it's just recognising there are, you know, those other health products out there that can provide you repeat prescriptions, and we clearly can't control how those um, health providers that are commercial organisations what they put on their website. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. And it's good to know that we're that the health service is moving towards yeah. that NHS app. And I also hope 
that it, it won't have advertising on it. Thank you. Okay. And you know, you know what we've seen through, particularly with the the COVID vaccination information and passport. You know, I think something well over half the population has now downloaded the NHS app. So I, I think it's becoming the app of choice. So you know, by adding on you know, the view of your GP record and, and other records, um, I, I believe that will be the app that that, that we'll all use. Thank you. Thank you, members. It's, it's evident that this is a complex and far reaching item covering a broad range of topics such as access to GP services, uh, diagnostic techniques themselves and patient records, just to name a, but a few. It's obvious that this, uh, particularly the patient record trial is going mainstream quite quickly. And that we should get considerable uh, further enhancements by through the video consultation part of it. There are members have expressed concerns uh, on the GP record itself. Uh, the possibility to opt out of sharing of, of, the, of the record. Except for emergency use. And that there are special cases such as domestic violence controls, which need to be confirmed to members for. For this. Um, we, we've covered it areas the fact that, that AI systems will have formal national approval which should be traceable and that's some we need to confirm training and certification is adequate and, and covers all of the, uh, the use of this. Uh, remote cons consultations of particular outcome uh, opportunity when, when it comes to uh, particularly surface or skin conditions and things of that nature. That the, the, during the development of this, some back-to-back -back comparison work has been done. I think there's reasonable confidence in that. Uh, that also that some thought needs to be given to the fact that this will be uh, tested in the uh, operating environment, that the, that the uh, NHS works works in and the and those implementing it need to think about think that through very carefully. And also that they confirm that the GPDS type data law compliance, although it's at the core of what uh, the NHS is doing, and there's a clear policy on that, that we're clear that the policy is being followed by detailed procedures that are, that are fully enacted. Um, Accessibility was also a, a, a key issue and back up in the event that someone struggles with accessing through these systems. Um, another question that was raised was that uh, telemetry data would be a great advantage to um, informing A&E particularly and other downstream parts of the system that are time critical, what the next steps for the patient are, where they're to be moved to, and, and, and things of that nature. And also that uh, there, was, there, was a, uh, there is a potential issue over patients' valid validity checking their data, that some pre-work and pilot work on that's been done. There's reasonable confidence that that's unlikely to cause or may not cause too much of a problem. Time will tell with, with that. I think that given the complexity of this, we'll return to the subject in the future as it matures, as a service matures. Can I take it that uh, given all of that, that members are happy to, uh, to recognize this uh, item? Thank you. Thank you for that, officers. I hope we've provided you with uh, some food for thought, which will ho hopefully improve the outcome for those that we care about most. Right, I'd now like to move on to item six, provision of sexual health treatment and prevention services, needs assessment, strategy, and approval to consult and procurement timeline for that. 
This is to inform scrutiny of the new sexual health strategy and proposed consultation, which will inform the future recommissioning of the Birmingham and Solihull Integrated Sexual Health Services. Officers presenting are Ruth Tennant, Director of Public Health, and Rob Davies, Consultant in Public Health. And Caroline Murray. Thank you. If you'd like to, officers, if you'd like to present. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. So I'll just say a few words and I'll hand over to um, Caroline Murray, who's our sexual health commissioner and expert on this, to um, go a bit uh, through a bit more of the details. So um, just by way of a bit, a bit of a background, and I appreciate we've put forward a lot of papers for this evening, so apologies for the um, amount of information you've received. Um, so one of our public health responsibilities, as a number of you will be aware, is that we're responsible for um, sexual health services in the borough. So that's both um, um, contraceptive services, but also um, sexual health prevention and treatment. So um, we, we commission a service jointly with Birmingham. Uh, so that arrangement's been in place for a number of years now. And last time we recommissioned this service, we did a lot of work to um, bring together what have previously been quite separate services to create a new integrated sexual health service, um, which has got its own branding. So some of you will be familiar or will have seen through the papers the um, umbrella branding that, that the service uses. So it's provided by... University Hospital Birmingham, but really has its own identity. And that's been one of the really important things that it has a, a separate identity and branding, um, you know, to remove some of the stigma that's historically been associated with some of those services, but also, you know, to make sure it's got the kind of appeal to some of the kind of really important audiences that we want to get to. Um, so we're now at that point as we get every few years where we need to have another look at the services that we're providing. So we're just starting that, that process at the moment. So although Umbrella has provided very, very good services and has done a huge amount of change, um, you know, and there've been really good service developments, we always want to make sure that we're reviewing that. Um, is there anything that we need to be thinking? Are there any improvements we want to make to services? And really important to actually going out and doing cons consultation with people to, um, you know, to, to get feedback from the public about um, what sort of things need to be reflected as we as we go through that process. Um, so what we brought tonight is really a kind of the, the, the draft strategy um, that's underpinned by a needs assessment that we've done jointly with Birmingham. Um, and the draft consultation questions again. So um, we wanted to bring that to you at this stage, along with a kind of timeline for when that's going to happen, um, just so that you're, you're, you're up to speed with, with what we're looking at, what some of the evidence is that's going to support that recommissioning of the services, um, with an expectation that we'll come back to scrutiny as we're a bit further down the line, um, if we do think that there's changes that we want to make to, to um, you know, Bring that, bring that back through scrutiny. So um, I'll hand over to Caroline to go through um, a bit more of the detail, and I'm sure there'll be um, lots of questions that people will want to ask later on. Thank you, Ruth, and good evening, councillors. Um, yeah, so we had um, the needs assessment done by an independent company, S Squared Analytics, uh, and from that we picked out the key points that we needed to feed into a strategy which we think will guide us um, on our future provision. The early thoughts are there was quite a bit of consultation done as part of the needs assessment. So the, pro the plan now is to have an open public consultation from the 28th of March that will run for four weeks and it will be widely promoted through both Solihull and Cam uh, Birmingham's comms teams, but also through UHB, they do quite a strong and they have a big following on their um, comms awareness. Uh, there are some final um, well tweaks going on to the strategy. For example, Councillor Tosico's um, photograph and name, um, that's already been uploaded. Uh, we're just waiting to get the final feedback from um, our governance structures, both in Birmingham and in Solihull, um, and the, the, the strategy will be amended based on those and the consultation questions. And we're, as I say, we're planning to uh, launch it on a website 
called Be Heard. Uh, we'll be directing Birmingham host the website, but all the relevant documents will be held on that website and we will be promoting it through all our own um, internal and external comms to direct people to that website so that they can provide feedback. Um, to date, um, the strategy has received um, good feedback. Um, we've tried to keep it um, accessible uh, and friendly. So there's been a lot of use of infographics within the strategy. But really interested to hear your thoughts and feedback and any questions you have. As Ruth said, the intention um, we're just starting work now on what we think a new specification for a service needs to look like. We are going to continue with the integrated model because it's seen as best practice national, but we will be seeking to maybe strengthen in some areas and some improvements, um, sort of linking to the earlier conversation and our learning from COVID. We know that digital access has been really useful for some, but we suspect a barrier for others. So there will be a balancing of that, uh, but definitely that will be included. And that's some of the learning that we've found over the last two years. So um, it depends on, would you like me to go through the key themes on the strategy or would you, are you happy to give some questions at this point? We'll take a few questions at this point. Uh, Councillor Brunt, would you like to kick that off? Thank you so much. Really um, interesting and detailed strategy. Um, and I really like the way that you've laid everything out. Um, couple of um, points. At no point can I find the words working age um, people, which I think is quite important because working age people are generally those who need contraception for pregnancy reasons. And Umbrella, the service, currently only operates till 6.30 at night. And there are plenty of people out there who simply cannot access the service because they are at work. Um, and this is something that I've raised before because, you know, particularly when we're looking at long active contraception, which yeah. currently is um, provisioned through GP services, as a woman, you basically have to take the morning off work if you want a coil, um, or in my case, 30 days when it goes wrong. Or, and, you know, you also have to have, um, you know, sort of maybe tell your manager or have kind of uncomfortable conversations, which isn't ideal. Um, when we look at this service, we really need to be aware that I do think some Saturday provision would be really, really important um, because it does put people off who are working. And these are the people who particularly when I, and I'm talking here, uh, unwanted pregnancies, that is that age group. They are people who are at work. So I really do think there needs to be something in there about how you are specifically going after that group of people. Um, second thing, um, page 30, lack of knowledge amongst practitioners on vasectomies and sterilizations. I think you also need to put on there the morning after pill. Um, I know of several local pharmacists who've had um, complaints. Um, admittedly, this is word of mouth, um, but people who have been given incorrect factual information from qualified and registered pharmacists on something like the morning after pill is not acceptable. Yes, I have made complaints and it has all been, you know, looked at, but equally, we need accurate information on something like the morning after pill, because that is one of the biggest ways that if, you know, something's happened the night before, um, women can can um, try to take um, preventative measures before we get to the stage of an abortion. Um, otherwise, I think that there's quite a lot of um, really good things in here. Um, you know, rates of long acting contraception. I, I completely agree. That is one of the biggest things we can do is um, increase um injection i know there's a trial at the moment where women are prescribed and then inject themselves these sorts of things are are really the way forwards um in terms of allowing women to take ownership of these issues but we really do need to be looking at how we get people who as i say will be at work during services um because you know these are the kinds of things that if we can get people the services earlier, won't then lead to 
abortions in the future. Um, I, I know um, it's, you know, something that is probably fairly logical. It's just not in the report at any stage. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, I think we picked up in the needs assessment and certainly I was with my Birmingham colleagues last week and we were discussing about out of hours provision, including weekends. Um, definitely long term, we would like to see that in place. But also there is an issue about we're still in recovery coming out of COVID. And what do we need to do to try and address any potential backlogs that are there around LARC? Um, in terms of pharmacies, um, we've had some learning around pharmacies. We know we want to increase the um, access through pharmacies to emergency hormonal contraception, but we would also want them to promote it. But certainly for Solihull, we want to see some of the learning that's come from Birmingham, where their pharmacies are offering what is, we're classing as almost a level two service. So they do much wider than just the morning after pill. And I think for us, it's about improving on what we've got, but also development. Um, there's a new, uh, uh, um, come out recently that they're looking at pharmacies potentially being able to do bridging uh, contraception for a month. So that if somebody goes to have um, the morning after pill emergency contraception, they could also get a prescription for uh, a mini pill for a month if they chose to do that. Um, so, yeah, I think this is all the sorts of things that we're looking at in the specification as we move forward. We're just trying to put together some of the key headlines from the needs assessment to see where we need to improve and strengthen. Um, but for now, for the strategy, really, it was about the five themes that we'd picked up if we thought they covered reasonably where we wanted to go. Yeah, uh, and, and uh, you know, I do think it's a good strategy. I think you've you've really um, covered a lot of um, of the things, um, and and I'm sure we'll procure a good service. As you say, the current service offered by Umbrella is is pretty good. Um, you know fairly good feedback even during covid i know there was a bit of difficulty at first getting through on the phone mm. but actually it that that did iron itself out um so you know it, it, it is it, this is a really really important service and as you say actually it's one of the the very classic financial ones where every bit of money you invest early saves us quite a lot so so there's pretty pretty good reasons for for doing um for doing this and and i i hope you get some pretty good feedback because it, it is it is genuinely quite accessible and it's not often that you see actually properly accessible um medical questionnaires but the language in it um and and the way it's set out is really good i i do i do just think that at some point there does need to be a little section on on um accessibility uh, and timings of that because you know particularly when we're looking at um in one section you look at the people who are most underrepresented which i have now lost um people from minority ethnic communities um individuals who are vulnerable experiencing sexual domestic violence uh, offenders in custody these kind of people uh, again you know um a lot of them are going to be at work so you know, I, I don't think it's good enough to not to not put it in the strategy that we are specifically targeting people at work. Thank you. Um, if on the action plan under theme three, some of the actions we'd early actions we'd identified was about increased availability of LARC and EHC, um, regularly review the information that's out there around contraception and increasing access to LARC. So I think. They're the headlines and what we'll have to sit behind that is the specification and the detail. But that certainly indicates our intentions to build on what we've already got and recognising um, that a Monday to Friday nine to five service is not the way forward and in, in the, new, the new decades, really. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McKenzie next. Thank you really detailed report this um but on page 23 it says the age group 15 to 24 i wondered where you got the age 15 from if you look on the umbrella site it states that um you can only access it if you're 16 or over 
Um, 15 to 24 is about the national chlamydia screening. Um, and it's one of the, it's nationally set at that age group. It doesn't mean that we don't offer screening to anybody who requires it, but actually that is the national cohort that we have to particularly target and we're measured against is the 15 to 24 because they're seen as a specifically high risk. Uh, girls under 16 would be technically raped if it was um, sexual intercourse. Yeah, and they do, and our safeguarding um, in sexual health provision is really robust, and they do check that absolutely um, around um, consent, and they're fully aware, and they check for um, issues around exploitation. But we will have some young people who are, whether they should or shouldn't be, are having consensual relationships, and actually we still need to offer them that check for chlamydia if... Um, they so ask for it or we think that you know they think it's required and it's national that age group has been set we haven't set that locally thank you i did google a lot of this today so if anybody was to look at my phone they'd be wondering what was going on um the cdc recommends that uh, yearly chlamydia screening should be done because uh, there's hardly any symptoms apparently yeah um so is there anything going forward with that yeah we 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 adhere to the national program guidelines which just changed actually um beginning of last year uh, where they're asking us to really target so keep the service open and accessible to all but we have to really target on 15 to 24 year olds and to pick up on that repeat testing so um, I think that's one of the ideas if we can develop our local pharmacies is that when somebody goes in for something like uh, emergency contraception, that's an indication that they've had uh, unprotected sex. And, you know, it may be with their um, long standing partner, but it may not be. And actually, that's an opportunity to offer um, a chlamydia screen. So it's about using those windows of opportunity the best we can. Uh, the new guidance also says that for um, young people, if they change their partners, to encourage them to have a, a screening. So we will be building all of that within the spec and within the performance measures and start checking against it. And they do report against that sort, those sort of figures. Okay, I think it's really important that. Um, what about education in schools? Yeah, so that is part of the programme. It's a, it comes under the building resilience theme. So we do have um, work that, that uh, under the current contract that they do do with education. And of course, since September um, last year, education have to do um, sexual healthy, healthy relationships work. So one of the areas that we want to improve on is to support schools in that work. And that'll be working with the safeguarding leads within schools, but also with the school nursing teams so that they have got really accessible information about what good sexual health services are around and what it looks like so that we can equip our young people to make good and positive decisions. Thank you. Just one last thing. Um, the umbrella is it's located at, it says, um, Mel Square, Seven Mel Square, which is Boots. Yes. So is we also have a, an outreach clinic um, in the north as well. Oh, that's good. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Penwell. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I thought this was a really good report and I really did like the uh, infographic style in it. So I thought it was great. I've got two questions. Um, one is about prevention and its place with this really. Um, I, my feeling is that a substantial underpinning cause of sexual health issues is uh, wrong relationships, relationships where there's an element of coercion and relationships with a misplacement of trust, relationships where there is a lack of consent to what goes on. Um, and I think we're failing to deal with that as a society. Um, 
the prevalence of pornography, which gives a misrepresentation of relationships, the prevalence of uh, activity on social media, which is uh, not commensurate with the building of good relationships, the emerging issue of virtual reality chat rooms where a lot of abuse is going on and so on. Um, and I'm just wondering where prevention fits into it. Um, there's not a great deal of reference to um, prevention and early intervention and so on in here. It, it's like touch, um, but maybe that is the right thing. But the question is, is there an overarching strategy that sits above both this strategy and other strategies where those issues are relevant, like the domestic abuse strategy, that actually tackles those issues and says, how is Solihull and its partnership going to tackle the prevention of the issues that lead to a lot of sexual health issues? Thank you, Councillor Pinwell. Um, yeah, there are absolute definite cross links between domestic abuse, sexual abuse and sexual health. And some of it will be picked up but linked because um, I work across all three areas, which I think makes that quite a good fit. Uh, within the actual strategy on theme four about building relationships, it, um, we have picked up really, it's about um, working with education um, to help them give get improved sexual outcomes, um, but I think they need some help education so that we can support teachers around this quite complex agenda and how we get out the right messages to young people. There's also a lot around sexual health about stigma and myths that we have to address. And certainly within the summer, um, summer loving, uh, UHB do a lot of really good campaigns where we try to get the messages out. Um, and part of the current integrated model, and we will continue to include this in future provision, is they partner up with RSVP, who are the specialist providers for Birmingham and Solihull on rape and sexual abuse. So they do referrals to them and they run an, a, a clinic, RSVP do as part of this um, current contract, which will be continued. And they also have access to um, domestic abuse specialist services as part of this whole contract and we would be wanting to definitely keep those two elements so that the, there are definite pathways from sexual health service when people access it and there's any concerns about any of these issues that they can do that um, good handover handshake really because it's within the service. Yeah, I, I know there's a lot of good work going on. I, I think my question was about where we find laid down in a strategic document of this quality, um, how we are going to tackle it over the coming years. How are we going to drive up rape prosecutions? How are we going to stem the levels of grooming that there might be in the society? How are we going to address um, the issues of trafficking which will undoubtedly lead to abuse and and health issues we, we, you know where is all that pulled together yes you're right so um at the moment we have work streams within the council who focus on exploitation and sexual abuse and sexual health and under the safer solihull board they've started working on vorg which is the violence against women and girls and although it has that name, and that is rightly so, because there is a, it is disproportionately impacts on females, the whole idea of taking um, a violence against women and girls approach is, is that you recognise the individual needs of all victims and the risks. So it gives that tailored response. So that will sit under the Safer Solihull board, but we have mapped out where the different elements of VORG have got a specialist focus within the, the local authority and wider across the region and how we link it all back together again. So will this strategy link into that and will there be cross references? Yes, then? definitely, yes. Okay. As will the sexual abuse and the domestic abuse and the exploitation, they all will feed into that overarching work of org. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.
Councillor Howell, please. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, Ruth and Caroline, for a, um, a really interesting report. I mean, again, just to echo what others have said, I thought it's an incredibly complex and incredibly important subject, but I think the, the infographics were incredibly informative and um, the text was very easy to read and it really draws out what the key issues are and how you intend to tackle them. So I really applaud you for that. It was, um, you know, very, very good and a very interesting read. Um, I've just got a few questions. Um, the first one, um, on page 18, it refers to a key enabler as being innovation and technology. And I think you referenced this in your introduction. Um, I've made the assumption that that perhaps is digital access or online access to services. Um, obviously very relevant given the topic that we've discussed previously on the agenda. And to me, in actual fact, that could actually be a really useful way for some patients to access this because of the yeah. added anonymity and confidentiality that that brings. And I just wondered if I could have a little bit more detail about how that might look. Yeah, so during COVID, they quite rapidly, obviously, because we all went into lockdown and face to face services stopped. So they did quite rapidly um, expand the digital offer. Um, you know, we are still doing analysis on it because, as we, you know, listened to earlier, it doesn't work for everybody. But we have found for some of our particular target groups that actually being able to um, access um, STI testing and self-sample themselves does actually remove lots of barriers because they don't have to um, go to a physical place and ask for that kit and um, they don't want to go to a clinic or they don't have time to go to a clinic or access um, and the myth the stigma around it you know they may not want to go to their local pharmacy or GP because they may know who they are and there's embarrassment. So we do know that we've got to keep with the digital um, offer. It's just about the balancing to make sure that the face-to-face -face and other formats are still there. I think around this area of work, there are lots and lots of developments, some of which have come out of COVID, where we are trying to in my view, I think what we're trying to do is reach into communities rather than them having to reach out. So this is where I think we want our pharmacies to do much more so that people haven't got to go to a clinic, they can go to the local pharmacies. Um, some of the balancing we've got and the challenges over the next 12 months is um, GPs play a really key role within this agenda. And of course, they've had immense external demands put on them um, through COVID for their involvement in the vaccination, but also a backlog of patients. So it's about how do we think about that differently? Um, so we are starting to think about, we know largely what we want in our future services, but it's about how we get it. And it may be bringing in different partners and remodeling it in a different way so that we've got that increased access and it's easier. So that's where I think the innovation is going to be is what else is out there and how can we make things a bit better so that we are actually put in access where it needs to be and when it needs to be. Yeah, thank you. That's that's really interesting. And I love that expression reaching in rather than <laughs> reaching out. Um, Second question, it was regarding theme four, um, building resilience. I think there's actually some really important concepts in this theme. It talks again about reducing stigma, having confidential, non-judgmental access to the service. And actually, to me, I think a lot of those I think a lot of those concepts are almost, it's almost like a golden thread that I think needs to be through the full strategy because I'm mm. sure a lot of those aspects are really important across all the other themes, particularly for instance, theme one, the priority groups. Is there any particular work that needs to be done in reducing stigma and discrimination in particular with some of those groups to enable them to access these services? So uh, it was just a well, more, a more a comment rather than a question really as to, your thoughts on that and whether you know there needs to be a little bit more of that across the whole strategy rather than it just sitting there as a standalone theme i suppose um my understates how you set things out is that a lot of the um areas of work we want to in building resilience will be about the approach that we will want in actually delivering all the other areas that we want to do within this so it's certainly um the way the contract works at the moment is there are a number of partners such as um, Birmingham LGBT, uh, we've got the youth services involved in helping to deliver this. And so it's those messages we want them to give out. What we were having discussions about last week with my Birmingham colleagues were 
about actually how can we better get over some of the barriers. I mean, some of the feedback we got from the needs assessment, which came into this, was things like um, actually putting sexual health services within homelessness hubs rather than expecting that person to have to go to a service. And some of that then is about that building resilience as well. So it is a thread. And I think that's really a good way to describe it. Some of them will sit alone where we're trying to do the work with schools and young people. But a lot of it will be in every element of the service that we are mandated to deliver and which we want to deliver. It's how do we do it in a way that works for people that's engaging and that they feel comfortable and able to use. Yeah, thank you. That's really good to hear. Thank you. Um, and then my final question is a very quick question regarding the draft consultation on page 51. It comes across as very Birmingham centric because it talks about do you live, work, study or socialise in Birmingham? Yes or no. But there's right. no mention of Soli Hull. Okay. So can you just reassure me yeah. that Soli Hull will be covered as well? Definitely. Thank you. I have a couple of questions to. Uh, one question is, does this uh, particular strategy give thought to signposting psychological care services, considering some of the things that are being highlighted in the system and that the psychological effect on some of those persons concerned could be quite severe. And the second, well, let's, let's deal with that one first. Okay, so the psycho counselling, um, some of that will be provided through RSVP. So if they want a referral there, there is actual um, an offer because it's part of the service. Very good. And the second is that for, but probably more relevant to those using pharmacies is the are the confidentiality uh, standards for pharmacy staff equivalent to those to nhs clinic personnel um yes because each of the pharmacies and um, they are bound by normal care quality commission regulations and also they have to do specific training um, when they want to do any work around sexual health, they have to be trained to a specific standard. And then how they manage that will, do with, will be the same as they deal with other customers when they're giving out prescriptions and they're doing other services within a pharmacy setting. They are actually bound by confidentiality. Um, and it's all done. They have to, to even um, apply to engage in this agenda. They have to have... Um, a room that is um, private and confidential. Uh, people can't see that you're in there. And, and they use those um, consultation rooms for lots of different services, but they do have to have those. This is not a service that they can do in the mainstream pharmacy. They have to have a, a space to do it in. Just picking up on that slightly, what about waiting facilities? Do they ensure they manage appointments so there aren't people waiting around outside somewhere like that um seen by others yeah I, I i'm going to be honest and say i assume that's what's happening but some of this like emergency hormonal contraception um we can double check with the pharmacies but i think the idea is that you would go in and if there wasn't they couldn't use that room then i think they'd be given a slot to come back when that was convenient for both them and when the room's free Okay, thank you. Right, we'll now move on to Councillor Dr Sexton. Thank you, and thank you for this really good and informative uh, strategy document. Um, it's uh, it's good to see all the all the great work that's uh, that's going on and that's being planned. Um, I think one of the great success stories in sexual health in recent years has been the development of prep pre exposure mm. prenatal access. Um, and the ability to prevent HIV infections in people in who have a higher risk. Um, can you describe what's being done at the moment to ensure that this is made available to as many people um, who are in need of that as possible, and also how that will develop with this new strategy? I know it's mentioned in there, but if you could give us a bit more detail, that would be great. Okay. Um, I'm really glad you've asked that, because actually the... Um... PrEP and our HIV work is it, we're far above the England rate. 
um, we there was some additional funding um, launched in a, um, around PrEP and HIV, uh, which Umbrella are doing some work on it and they've been outperforming on it. Um, so we're really confident and that will definitely carry on. I mean, the National HIV Action Plan is to eliminate um, AIDS by 2030. And certainly having just done some performance analysis today, it is definitely one of our almost dark green areas because <laughs> we are performing that well in it. That's yes, I think just to add to that, I think it's one of the areas we really benefit from being joined with Birmingham. Yes, definitely. Because obviously, you know, we thankfully have small numbers of, uh, you know, HIV, mm. pe people with, living with HIV in the borough. And actually sometimes in areas like that, it can get a bit lost, whereas we really benefit from being um, in Birmingham that have got much higher rates and also clinicians that are, you know, as Caroline's indicated, you know, that they've been ahead of the game in, in, in trialling some of this. So I think it's, it's one of the advantages of having a, you know, bigger integrated service that we really benefit from some of that. Fantastic. It's, it's really good to hear how well we're doing on that. Um, in terms of risk groups, um, something that came to my attention recently is that um, when it comes to HIV in particular, women are often diagnosed late, um, mm. and especially when they may not be aware that their partner is putting them at risk. Um, now, obviously, as a risk group, that's a hard group to identify, but there's likely to be some overlap with domestic violence victims. Um, is work being done to try and make um, prep and other preventative work available to people in that group? So um, when we look at, because we, we actually measure as our performance indicators about how many people um, who attend services are offered a HIV screening. And yes, more men are offered than women. And we don't know whether that's um, why. We don't really know. We need to do a little bit more work on that. But we, there is a clear understanding that our men are more at risk um, of HIV um, infection than females but certainly we want to move towards the fact that anyone that's attending any services are offered a hiv screening we also see that women decline when they are offered that screening in greater numbers but anyone that's engaged with health services they are offered a hiv screening and i think that's why we've had such good success and progress in this because they are very proactive at um inviting and offering that HIV screening as just part of a normal what we're trying to do is get to the point that this just becomes part of a normal sexual screening process rather than trying to separate it out absolutely and I think addressing some of that stigma around that is, is obviously yeah. really important work yeah. that's that's ongoing um, I mean, going back to um, thing about domestic violence victims, I know that they're mentioned in the strategy, although they seem to be omitted from the list in the fair treatment assessment when um, talking about uh, particular groups. Um, I think it was on page 56. Um, so I, I, I wonder whether that's an omission that might be, be looked at. Um, but it does seem that uh, domestic violence victims um, in, in some cases may not be aware of the risks that they might be at. Is that a conversation that um, is, can be approached um, in, in some of the work that we do with, with that group? And is that something that um, can be looked at in conjunction with this strategy? Um, yeah, I mean, I know um, they get, there's a direct referral there from um, sexual health service into dedicated domestic abuse provision, which is provided by Birmingham Solihull Women's Aid. I suppose how I could reasonably easy pick that up, apart from um, picking out in the um, fair treatment assessment, although nationally, although they um, women who are experienced and subjected to domestic abuse have lots and lots of risks in lots and lots of areas, they're not nationally picked out at being specifically a higher risk group around sexual health than other groups you know that there's lots of people and individuals and cohorts that have needs around sexual health but what we've put in the strategy is some of the the really top headline groups and um, but certainly i can when i'm working um with my domestic abuse hat on just make sure that those pathways from those services into sexual health are really clear 
Fantastic. That's very helpful. Um, thank you very much. And again, thank you for some, for some great work in that. Any further questions from members? No, thank you, ma'am. Some of our members have raised a couple of a number of issues. Uh, one is that ac improved access and flexibility for working age persons to reduce mm -hmm. the impact on their working day, and and having to explain things to employers and things like that, is 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 particularly valuable for many service unions. This should fit in with the work their work commitments which will obviously improve uptake of these key services, timely uptake. Uh, pharmacy access needs to be completely confidential. And uh, I'm encouraged by the comments that this is of, of equivalent of confidentiality to clinic access. Um, Digital offer is, is, is a good way of, of, of set it, setting that up and also would enable us to manage things like preventing queuing and, and the fact that this it must be completely opaque to anyone around the patient because of the risks to, to many of these patients would be severe if, if this became unnecessarily obvious to people. There's also a key, the key risks with other conditions and also particularly worrying risks, risks to um, domestic violence. It, this is a particularly dangerous area when it comes to relationships. I'm oh, just checking if there's anything that I've uh, missed in that. Uh, The other item is that these services need to be easily available to sub-16 age patients that present. Obviously a very difficult area to manage and there are a number of issues that related to that. But this is an area that we can't afford to ignore. And also, also that we should be very careful to be able to signpost psychological care for those that are particularly suffering obvious signs of distress or potential for, for psychological issues. Members, have I missed anything key? Not. Thank you very much, members. So I think we could say that we uh, recognise the contents of this report and it's that, that this will represent progress to improve Sexu the sexual health strategy and that the consultation process will inform the future commissioning model of Solium Birmingham Integrated Sexual Health Service. Uh, we have the feedback which was just mentioned. Um, and uh, the, the issues informed by this will be uh, used to consider, we be considered as part of ser subsequent service recommissioning. Uh, just a quick question, um, as a cabinet member, any, any comments on the, either of these two subjects? Um, just a general comment about the report itself, um, Councillor McCarthy. I think the, the report is, is is an excellent report. It's it's also very easy to read with the the infographics, which I think is useful. Uh, and the consultation process, I think that will that will help hopefully get some good response. I think it's um, a very good example of how integrated working can produce a good result between the two areas, Birmingham and Solihull. And I look forward to seeing what comes out through the consultation and how we can develop this, uh, this strategy even further than it is now. Thank you, Councillor DeSico. Officers, have anything further to add? It's... No? Thank you very much. And we can move on to the, our final item, which is item seven, the, our work programme.
purposes of the report attached to is to provide summary of the work undertaken by our board this year in the municipal year 21-22 up to this date. Members, has anyone got any comments on that? You're all doing what I did when I saw it this evening. <laughs> Perhaps I should just clarify the reason for this piece of work, which is fairly new to this board, is that we do have some kind of a running account of where we're getting to, and that we should be in a in pole position to produce a prompt report, an accurate report of the board's work at the end of the municipal year. Thank you. Can I take it at that? report so far is accepted. We can, of course, return to this topic during our... I think we've got one more meeting, haven't we? Yep. Thank you very much, members. Uh, with that, I'd uh, consider this meeting closed. Thank you.